Thank you, Dean Van Cleve, to President Angel, to Chairman Waldman and the trustees, to the faculty, to all of the friends and family members, and to the class of 2014. All right, your first assignment, graduates, is to turn to your parents and thank them now. <laughs> Let me start off by saying I have no illusions that you're going to remember anything that I say today. <laughs> in fact, when I was sitting in your shoes many, many years ago, I was floating quite high, thrilled by what was happening. Not high in the way you just thought. <laughs> Took me a little while, but I got it. Uh, but frankly, I don't remember anything the commencement speaker said. I don't remember who the commencement speaker was. So I have a very simple message for you. Be gritty. I like that word, gritty. It suggests our Western values. There's a reason why people like us gravitated to the left coast. Sure, we like the ocean breeze and the lack of hurricanes and superstorms. Uh, we embraced the flower children and medical marijuana before the rest of the country did. And the Beach Boys created California Girls, although most of us aren't blonde and wouldn't be caught dead in a bikini. We are here because we believe in going where others wouldn't dare. I love telling the story about two guys who, 35 years ago, sat at an outdoor table in front of Perry's here in San Francisco. And they believed that they could start a revolution, a new industrial and scientific revolution. These guys were gritty. They really didn't know each other very well. They drank a few beers. The end of three hours shook hands and by so doing founded not just a new company, but a brand new industry. Of course, I'm talking about Herb Boyer and the late Bob Swanson, founders of Genentech. In South San Francisco alone, there are now 80 plus biotech and biomedical companies. In the Bay Area, probably hundreds. Now, people with grit aren't afraid to tank. Take Steve Jobs in his early 20s. Here's a guy who didn't do well in high school or in college. In fact, he dropped out of Reed College after the first six months. By his early 20s, he's failing by any ordinary standard. And he's hanging out with sketchy people including a geeky programmer named Wozniak. The two of them spent their days and nights tinkering in Jobs' parents' garage down the peninsula. But Jobs was gritty, and he was determined to create something that hasn't been done before, a home computer. Not a multi-million dollar computer from IBM, but something that everyone can have in their home. He asked questions like, what if the computer could do graphs and charts? What if it could type on it? What if you could play games? What if the computer played music? Now, it takes grit to create these computers. You have to imagine doing something a thousand times better. Because remember, the important uses for that computer hadn't even been invented yet. But Jobs had the grit because Jobs was obsessed. Now, he and Wozniak worked on it for 10 years. Went from two of them to 4,000 of them and a $2 billion company. Jobs was then 30 years old. And guess what happened? He got fired. Fired from the very company he had created. 
So my story is similar without the billion dollar ending. You're looking at a three-time loser. I lost my very first election for student body president in high school. <laughs> I was pretty devastated. In fact, I was humiliated. I was a loser. I got over it. Then I lost for Congress in 1979. Then I lost for lieutenant governor in 2006. Here's what I know. Success is never final, and failure is never fatal. In fact, I keep a paper weight on my desk in Washington, D.C., and it asks a very simple question. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? What would you do if you knew you could not fail? It's like a touchstone for me. I test it all the time. Just last week, I took a leap of faith. A lot of people had counseled me not to move forward on an amendment, challenging why the military chain of command thought it should continue to decide whether or not those accused of rape should be prosecuted or not. Now, the military chain of command doesn't have lawyers making those decisions. No, they have generals making those decisions with no legal training whatsoever. And in part, that's why we have 26,000 men and women in the military every year who are sexually assaulted. But only 5,000 of them report that crime, and less than 250 are actually convicted of that crime. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the wrong people are in charge for making a decision whether or not to prosecute. So I took that amendment up in the Armed Services Committee. I came three votes short of getting it passed. Now, some would say that that was a loss, but it was the right thing to do because we have now established how strong our opposition is to the status quo. And I'm taking that amendment up on the floor in less than three weeks. <laughs> so failing always sets you up for winning. So I tell you these stories because all of you have grit. We know that because you've survived law school. You've already a thousand times better off than you were when you began. You've done it once. You've made yourself a thousand times better. But now I ask you, are you really gritty? Can you make the world a thousand times better? Gritty people aren't afraid to ask that question. Part of being gritty is being willing to be disruptive. Some of you will become attorneys to clients like the next Genentech, or a Airbnb, or Uber. You'll be allowed to demonstrate your grit by being disruptive. Sometimes, if you're in the right place at the right time, that's a way to rapidly make the world a thousand times better. One of the other disruptive persons in the room is going to ask you about the law. They're going to ask you a basic question such as, is this legal? I know it'll make a lot of money, but is it legal? If, you are, if you've got the right client and they are really gritty with a deep character, they'll also ask you the question, is what we plan ethical? Hopefully, your moment to start being gritty will be at that conference table in a high rise or in that startup workspace um, somewhere in Soma. You'll be the attorney, and if you're really in the presence of genius, you'll be swept up by the dream. You'll want to say yes when asked if it's legal. You'll want to say yes if you're asked whether this bold vision is ethical. But your duty as an attorney and the way you'll really show your grit is if you are capable of saying no. 
You see, being gritty also includes the ability to say no when no is indeed the toughest answer. Much of the financial collapse in this country was caused by lawyers and financiers who thought they were making the world a thousand times better by making themselves a million times richer. Before the collapse, these bigwigs had fancy names like the London Whale or Fabulous Fab. The press certainly made them seem gritty. All this money was going to make the world a thousand times better by bringing home ownership to those who never could afford to buy a home in the first place or make the company's return even greater. Well, we all know how that ended, don't we? Imagine if someone had questioned the fabulous fab. Maybe Goldman Sachs wouldn't have contributed so heavily to the downturn along with Bear Stearns, AIG, and Lehman Brothers. Maybe the millions of long-term unemployed in this country would still be at work instead of struggling. I've spent 30 years in public office, and I've been moderately successful. But the truth is, I could have been way more successful if I had taken my law degree and gone to court. Changes in this country come about today in at least three ways. Through someone being disruptive in te technology, or someone changing a law, or someone going to court and winning or losing a case. Brown versus the Board of Education changed the way we looked at discrimination in this country. It didn't happen in Congress. It happened in the Supreme Court. U.S. versus Windsor recognizes for the first time on the federal level that same-sex marriages are great. Now, that hasn't happened yet in some of the states, but it's in the courts where we truly get to some of the core values that we have as human beings. Today I'm asking you to be gritty, to say yes when the chance to make the world a thousand times better is before you and it's legal. Say yes when it's ethical, say no when it's not, and when it simply isn't right. I've been racing against time for 36 years. It's like a clock that is about to strike midnight and my life is coming to an end. Now that's a little melodramatic, but let me say it another way. Don't waste a minute. Don't waste a minute on thankless friends, on boredom, or on an unfulfilling job. 36 years ago, I thought I was dying on a remote airstrip in South America. I was 28 years old. My body was riddled with bullets. Back at Jonestown, nearly 1,000 people were dead or dying, most of them murdered, including infants in the arms of their parents. Anyone who tells you that Jonestown was a mass suicide is either lying or simply ignorant. Infants don't commit suicide, and people who have guns at their heads aren't committing suicide. On November 18, 1978, I wasn't gritty. I was just trying to survive. 23 hours bleeding out, drinking rum to kill the pain. The people who found me thought they were being nice to a dying woman, so they put me on the side of the airstrip unfortunately on an anthill. Um, I must tell you, you don't sweat the small stuff when you're dying. Um, <laughs> during all this time, I'm thinking I may not make it. I may never get married. I may never have 2.5 kids. I'll never be able to see my grandmother again, a woman who was my inspiration. Being a good Catholic girl, I said the act of contrition and waited for the lights to go out. But as time went on, and I didn't die, I also started to focus on what might happen if I survived. I vowed that if I got out of there alive, that I would dedicate every day to public service. I tried to make the world a thousand times better. I'm still trying, and I'm not wasting a minute. 
Now, some of you haven't wasted a minute because you know what it's like to literally be under fire and counting those minutes. I would like to have you all applaud the veterans who are graduating here today. Some of you formed the Veterans Law Student Association in the spring of 2013. The association now has 48 student members. I particularly like the fact that the membership involves veterans as well as non-veteran supporters because the issues that plague those who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan involve every one of us. I find war abhorrent, but we must never, never turn our backs on those who served and subsequently need help. One of the association founders, Sarah Aquinto, has become a member of my post 9-11 Veterans Committee, which has two distinct missions, to help other veterans and to promote a better public understanding of veterans as members of the community and the workplace. I would like Sarah and every member of the Veterans Law Student Association, veterans and non-veterans, to rise and thank you for your service and for caring. <laughs> Class of 2014, you really don't have another minute. You are already gritty, but you won't be gritty permanently. You can go soft. When you walk from this auditorium, you'll have to prove yourself all over again. Make this world a thousand times better. You don't have to bleed on behalf of your country to make a contribution to it. But you will have to ache from time to time as choices you make may find you sick. You will have to wrestle with what is right and what is wrong. You will have to lose sleep. You will have to learn how to get swept up in the vision, but to say no and to, to survive the scorn of those who simply find it cheap and profitable to say yes. Graduates of the class of 2014, you will soon be stewards of the law of the United States of America. Graduates, make history. Be gritty. Thank you.